You're listening to All Things 3D, where we talk about the world of fabricating, designing, and capturing in the third dimension. Hey, All Things 3D, Friday edition episode. Whoa! <laughs> what was that, Mike? <laughs> uh, what? What are you talking look about? Like, look like, uh, what are you talking about? Uh, huh? Looks like John claude Van Damme. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> Man. <laughs> Man. John claude Van Damme. Whoa. What was that? What was that? Jean claude Van Damme is on our program? Wow. We are Man, lucky to get in the shot. <laughs> Jeez. Jeez. All right. Today Man. is February 6, 2015. We're just monkeying around. It's Friday, and we're just enjoying this rocket ship called 3D. Right now, we live in the technology era, and uh, we have lots of exciting stuff to uh, talk about that happened over the week. Of course, as usual, I'm Chris. I'm Mike. And we're going to take you into Week in Review. So uh, what do you want to talk about, Mike? I don't know. Why don't you start off with your first item? All right. Well, um, I guess I will go into uh, one of... We had we obviously had some big news with the uh, Raspberry Pi um, this week. Um, it's not super 3D related, but um, I think it will become 3D related eventually. The Raspberry Pi announced their Raspberry Pi 2, and Microsoft announced a free version of Windows 10 that is compatible on it. So uh, we are going to see the next, uh, this is a, obviously a quad core, uh, so the, the old, the Raspberry Pi B plus, the, you know, first, it was actually probably like the fourth iteration they're already on. Um, but that one was a single core. This one's like ten times more powerful, has a bunch more memory, a bunch more outputs, so uh, pretty cool. Um, looking forward to getting my hands on one. Uh, Mike, you already ordered one, right? I did. I actually ordered it from Make or Maker, whatever, Maker.com or something like that. They charge a little bit more. It's pre-ordered, but uh, yep, went ahead and ordered one. And I'm also a on their developer list at Windows. They just sent an email saying more news to come. So don't expect yeah. anything new from them yet. Yeah, and, and the Raspberry Pi, you know, the only thing 3D related so far that I, I've, I've used one for is that the print to peer. So the guest we had on, i um, trying to remember his name, really cool guy. Um, you can use a Raspberry Pi to effectively control your printer as a standalone. So you don't need a, a, a whole PC or even to have a, uh, you don't even need to have an SD card reader, you know, or expensive, uh, more expensive Rambo board. You could have an Arduino hooked up via USB to a Raspberry Pi and print direct to it for 35 bucks. So you could save yourself a little bit of money. This new one is like 10 times more powerful or something like that and uh, and, it, and you can get your hands on a free copy of yeah. Windows 10 through the Windows Developer Program. Yeah, and it, it also has one gig of memory. As you mentioned, it's 10 times faster. People say, well, how did you come up with that? Uh, they have an explanation on their website. Uh, but the other thing to keep in mind, uh, well, back to your your print servers. Also, there's a product called AstroPrint, which is the one that I use. It's also Raspberry Pi. Uh, uh, they have an S, not SD, an ISO for it. So if you want to work with that particular, or I'm sorry, a Raspberry Pi image. So if you wanted to work with that, I don't remember the cost of it, but it's very reasonable. I personally like that one because they actually will slice G code directly. Um, yeah. So like the other one where you have to go through their slicer, uh, at least in the version that I had. I guess they're going to support that soon, if not already. Astroprint does support G-Code right now. The other thing to keep in mind, especially with the Windows, that uh, you know, I don't know how complete the Windows 10 will be, but if you remember our friend Steve Hernandez um, with his SLA application that we're using tablets for, but that may also be a good location or reason to get one of these um, fast machines. You know what? I didn't even that. think about that because now we can run Creation Workshop directly on this. So you know what? I mean, like right there, I, I was like, oh, well, it's not really that 3D related, but it kind of is because it's a full-blown computer. And, mm -hmm. you know, not only that, but like, you know, I run Linux on my Raspberry Pis around here. Um, you know, I, I run a, a dummy version of uh, Debian Linux uh, to run my Gawky Pi, um, and then I have another uh, another uh, Pi that I use just for like you know kind of test computing. 
And I can't imagine a ten, one that's ten times faster how great of, I mean, like, now anybody could have a, a full-fledged PC. You just go buy a monitor. Yeah, well, keep something in mind, though. This is an ARM-based A7. So this is a the ARM-based uh, version of Windows NT, or if you remember, they came out with the Windows RT tablets that really tanked. So it is a, um, a forked version that works specifically on ARM. And I don't think Stephen Hernandez Creation Workstop is has been ported over to it yet. But if he's listening or watches it later, hey Steve, might think about it. Could be a cool little project. You know, with those LCD touch panels, pretty cheap. You know, you can put yourself together. Well, you know, what's funny is that all together with the with all the interface stuff that you would require, you may be spending as much as getting a little Windows tablet. So, um, if you want a fun project, Steve think about it. Uh, otherwise, keep supporting those little Windows tablet. They're just getting cheaper and they work great. Okay. Well, and one of the one of the coolest parts about a Raspberry Pi too is you can remote into it. Like my Gawky Pi, I don't even need a, a monitor, a keyboard, or a mouse. You can just put it right on your network and it pops up if you have a query tool you know, in your arsenal, which is freely downloadable, and then you can remotely uh, plug into it and even install uh, like VNC tools on it so that you can you can actually you know uh, you know basically remote desktop in and have you know so if you've already got a computer you can basically implement another computer without having to you know go through the several hundreds of dollars that are required for most PCs nowadays. Uh, yeah, totally agree. And same thing with AstroPrint, which is an, another excellent. Uh, print server if you need something like that. So let me jump into my item here and uh, you know next week we're going to be doing an interview with the company that's created uh, the extruder in color injection system uh, called Spectrum or something of that nature and we're doing an interview with them on Tuesday but I also wanted to bring up this. This is something called something um, from ST3D Chameleon 3D which uses um, multiple plastics into a, I think it's a four-headed extruder, and it will mix them, what do they say, um, 500 microns, 0.5 millimeters uh, layers, so which is pretty cool. I guess that's what it, the time it takes from it to move from one uh, filament to another. But if this is an example and not a, a render, I mean, it's pretty good. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. It's a couple of guys in Israel. It's, one of them was a graphics artist and just wanted to get into 3D printing. It seems like a lot of the, not necessarily graphics, are a 3D artist. Um, so they've been working on this. They've got a, several printers. Hopefully I can get them on to do an interview. Um, the only thing that might be somewhat hesitant is its price. It's uh, priced at $73.50. So it's a little pricey, but uh, if you need direct um, color, and because they use four, they can actually do a CMYK, um, what do you want to call it, um, blending. So um, you could do reasonable color. And then they, you know, they talk about the other versions. Like I said, we're going to be interviewing Spectrum 3D on uh, Tuesday, uh, which uses a different technique where they inject color directly into the filament itself. And uh, we've shown it on a previous show, the capabilities with that. So obviously color is coming along and it looks like it might be in a great price point. So um, we'll, we'll see about getting them on soon. Uh, if you want to support them, they say within eight weeks, they're taking pre-orders now, but within eight weeks they're delivering. Wow. So really cool. So one item. So back to you. Awesome. My next so item. Well, you know, oh. Chris, I didn't switch to myself, so I apologize that. Um, no, you're, you're up. You're up. I am now, but I wasn't before. No, you so are. So again, here's... You were. Was I? Yeah, you are. Are you? I, well, you no, were. I just clicked. Well, here, you know what's funny is that you can't, it shows you automatically my screen because it's just the two of us, but the problem is since I control it on my end, the YouTube audience doesn't see it. And I've watched it when I review these. So I, again, mm -hmm. apologize, audience, for not switching my screen. But I'll rotate it really quickly. Um, and plus, in the show notes, there's a link out to their website. So again, right. I apologize for not... No, no, I, 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 th I think it's showing up. Um, cool, yeah, that's a really cool... Uh, I can't wait to, to you know, kind of kind of see if the uh, demo of this machine kind of in process. Um, awesome. So uh, my next item, 
uh, comes from one of my favorite people here. Um, his name's Mike Adams. He's known as the Health Ranger online. Um, he has a, a really popular website amongst, uh, he's kind of an independent journalist uh, and, a, and a real critical thinker. Um, he's got some real, uh, real interesting, he's, he's, all, he's in a lot of documentaries, um, you know, that, that are real popular even on Netflix, YouTube, he's, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a real info warrior. So, uh, but he has a new project he just launched, real exciting, really excited to see uh, what he comes up with, with this. Um, here's the announcement trailer, I think we'll just, uh, I'll just kind of play. Um, I'll just kind of play what I can here, and uh, he basically has unveiled foodrising.org, and it's a 3D printed uh, food grow system um, to kind of enable people to 3D print and grow their own food in your own home um, in very little space, home or apartment, wherever you live, um, kind of uh, in an effort to uh, regain food independence, which is a really important thing for a... a for the world that we live in today, that we're we're constantly experiencing chronic illness, um, you know, malnourishment, uh, you know, most of the most of the disease and chronic illness that we find today uh, can be avoided uh, just by eating the eating better eating better foods. But a lot of people can't afford the better foods. So what he's done is he's come up with a uh, a grow system. Um, that is, I, I think, vertical, a vertical type grow system, and it's all 3D printed, or most of it is uh, 3D printed, and um, he's kind of got like a, this is like a teaser trailer on his website at foodrising.org, um, and he's taking donations for 250 food rising grow systems. There he even has a little little spot. Ah, look at that. I didn't even notice that the first time around. And um, he's got a, a little SolidWorks demo um, showing how he's designing some pieces. So what an crazy, uh, what a crazy talented guy Mike Adams is. I mean, he's he's just always has such great information, um, not only about food. He, I mean, he's a he's a food scientist, so he like does lab testing um, for for toxic heavy metals in different food pro like health food products to make sure that you know to keep these people accountable that are that are putting out expensive health food on people. But he's also taking it to the next level and enabling people. Uh, to grow their own food, so uh, total hats off to this guy. What a gr what a what a tremendous effort. So, yeah, it's it's really neat. But I'm going to be the what would you call it? Uh, the skeptic. Uh, the skeptic. No, not to say skeptic. The you know the one of the reasons why fast food uh, industry has grown in the way it has is one people have less time, but more importantly, people don't want to cook anymore, and. Uh, and if they aren't cooking for themselves and even going to the grocery store, what's going to motivate them to actually create their own garden? Um, you know, sadly, uh, I'm not much of a green thumb, so I may not be the person to really talk about this. And I have a little area that I can grow food. And in one year, I grew a lot of tomatoes and used them. Um, but I don't do this consistently. Right. What does he offer in his system to make this super easy? And is it just like you build a little system and you put some seeds in it, and voila, you've got a garden? Well, I think is that easy, think, or is he, I is think, he moving in that I think direction? One of I think one of the the biggest challenges um, just in beha human behavior is the placement of different um, you know different you know you have to train your behavior and you have to make it easy. Um, to to uh, practice good behavior. So um, you know, some people that are, you know, like for me, uh, I I love to meditate, um, but I found it, you know, I found that there's barriers because if you don't have a place that's right in front of you that you can go and sit, and a place that's private where you're not going to be bothered with the phone ringing and you're sitting in this, you know, you're you're sitting where your email is going off every five seconds. It's hard to make that a habit, but if you if you make a like a grow system like this, if you make it uh, something that's like right in front of you in your kitchen when you come home, like hey, here you can you're it's all automated, you know, it's watering itself, it's taking care of itself for the most part. Obviously, you have to take care of it to to some degree, like you have to harvest and you know plant things. Um, but it, hopefully, what I'm what I'm hoping is that one of the coolest parts about open source is that. People like myself or or others 
rather than having um, the responsibility of this entire project resting on one person's shoulders, the beauty of an open source project is that thousands of people can get involved and, do, and, and kind of contribute their ideas and incorporate them into this one great idea uh, that's, you know, the encompassing idea of growing your own food using 3D printed parts uh, and make it modular so you can grow the system and have it inside or at least somewhere right by your living, you know, because a lot of people, they, they A, don't have space and they don't they don't have the garden like near where they're you know tra tracking through their home you know so they're not reminded hey harvest me or hey you know it's easier for them to go to the market well this what what i'm looking forward to is like maybe this is actually easier and cheaper than having fast food and you could have fresh whole food right in your house which you know that's what that's what most people are lacking you know we see oh, well you right. mentioned you mentioned some good points you know if all you have to do is plant you know do the preliminary setup of um, I'm assuming there needs to be soil there needs to be seeds but then it automates the watering and ensuring that it gets the proper UV in order to grow yeah I could see this thing you know taking off and because you know a lot of time pruning or even removing the the vegetables is is an easy process of just picking and as you said it would be kinda of cool to have this in the kitchen so yeah I like the idea let's see where we can go with it and you, hopefully you'll give us some updates in the future yeah yeah I'm looking I'm, I'm gonna try to uh, uh, actually see if uh, Mike could Mike would uh, be interested in coming on our program once he has more details uh, for us and, and maybe once this site is launched and he's got some stuff to download uh, maybe he can come on and kind of uh, promote and talk about his uh, this actual project. We'll hear it during the horse's mouth. That would be great. Yeah. All right, well, I'm going to move on to my item. Mine isn't as serious. Mine, uh, some of you who've been into 3D uh, art and so forth, and some of you think this is somewhat lowbrow and, and beneath a true 3D uh, illustrator or uh, designer, but that's uh, thre um, as 3D, which has been around for, gosh, years now, uh, 15 years. They create free um, programs to bring in uh, their 3D content, and you know, you may not be aware of this, but a lot of times, a lot of magazines and illustrators will grab one of their models. You know, they have a a woman and a man uh, that they have used over years called the Genesis 2 that are very, very realistic. They were scanned and then retextured, and then other people have retextured, and you can get some extremely realistic humans. But it's all been on the computer or in print. Now they have finally, and just say that people have been using their products already uh, to, to 3D printing, but now they're embracing 3D printing and licensing, and this is the key, for personal use only, and they still haven't figured out how they're going to do it. Let's say myself, if I want to offer um, certain types of fantasy characters with people's heads on them, which I'll talk about a little bit later, that still can't be done. They haven't figured out the licensing for that, so I still have to go uh, with another product called Poser or some open domain character bodies that I can then reshape. Uh, but it is a good start. Um, currently, right now, they they offer the 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 um, three D printed objects for free. Oh, actually, I shouldn't say they're free. One of the things is you can get their creative tool for free, but the content. You know, it's you know, it's the blade versus uh, razor scenario. So they give you the the 3D program for free, but you have to buy the content. I think they even include some free stuff. But uh, it's a nice little area that other people contribute to. They've got a lot of cool stuff out at their site, and now that you can actually print what you've made, uh, I think that may even move this thing further. Obviously, right here they have something. They've got a little video here. Um, uh, it's they kind of neutered the object, so that's why I'm showing it. But uh, as you can see there, Whoa. Uh, you have the you have the Hello. ability to, yeah. Um, <laughs> but these are very extremely high mesh, high quality um, figures that you can then clothe, you know, just like dolls, which I think some people get into. But then you can create these objects, put them in your own virtual worlds, but now you'll be able to print them and color them. So, you know, if you're already doing this, hats off uh, to Daz3D for offering this ability. Uh, they are fully uh, 
watertight meshes so that you can go from creating them directly out to 3D printing. Wow. Uh, you may notice that uh, they, they seem to show the, the female body more than anything else, but they do have <laughs> a wide selection of uh, good-looking men in there as well, so you know, it's not just uh, yeah, yeah. female. Would um, <laughs> yeah. However, they, they do have printed printers that you can look at. They have collections and, uh, and soon-to-be custom print services that you can work with as well. Uh, like I said, it's free. Content is reasonably priced, and you can move from there. So on to you for your next item, Chris. Awesome. Yeah, and it is worth mentioning. We, uh, we have a special guest that's coming up here in about three minutes. Uh, we've got... Uh, it's not Kenny... No, it's... Uh, no, no, Kenny's uh, dead. Oh. It's Harris Kenny. Harris <laughs> Kenny from ALF Objects, uh, Lul's bot. He's, uh, he's joining us uh, live from uh, Colorado where they make the Lul's bot printers. And, uh, but I'm going to move on to my next item and then we'll get into it with him. Um, my next item is a Kickstarter that's got nine hours to go. Uh, I gave him a buck because it's open source. It's the Atlas 3D. It's a 3D scanner that you can print and build yourself. Um, so for a buck, they keep you informed, they keep you in the loop, and they give you the 3D printed printable files. I already have a lot of the components. That's why I didn't back the whole the whole shebang. But um, looks like a pretty straightforward, um, simple uh, laser 3D scanner. But it looks like it does a pretty decent job. And um, Mike, you actually gifted me one that has most of the same components. Yep. But the software kind of uh, never went anywhere. The guy, uh, mm -hmm. the guy, kind of did a Kickstarter and uh, didn't really do anything with it. So maybe this guy will have a different. Um, well, it looks like there. What does he got? He has a uh, a shield and a standard Arduino. If you remember the one that uh, I, as you said, gifted you, uh, was a version that used the what do they call it? The micro Arduino. It's it's the smaller little version, but you know you should be able to just pull that out, put this one in its place. Um, it may use a different stepper motor or servo um, in order to rotate the the platter, but uh, you, you already have the lasers, like you said. You've got line lasers, so it should be a fairly easy job. I don't know what they're using for a camera, um, so you may have to get the camera they're using. Um, but, um, uh, here's the parts down here. Atlas 3D. Uh, it's a 5 megapixel sensor, it just says. And it looks like... Oh, it's a Raspberry Pi camera, because it's just a Raspberry okay. Pi. So I already have oh. everything here. Yeah, so it's just you a little Pi do. camera. In yeah, fact, so I'm wondering if this would benefit from the version 2 I just got. Well, I'm yeah, maybe. To this. Yeah. Well, yeah. I should improve it because if it's doing its own processing, it may or may not. I'm assuming it might be. Otherwise, it's like an overkill to use a Raspberry Pi for this. But if it's doing its own processing, meaning using the, um, uh, what's the, I can't think of the SDK now, but uh, there's one that a lot of them, OpenCL. Uh, if they're using OpenCL, then... Uh, then, uh, yeah, the faster version will allow you to process much quicker with it. But if they're just using it as a motor turner and turning on the uh, the lasers and then capturing them in is somewhat of an overkill. But so, I'll look into it. I'm sorry, so go he's ahead. got, for 149 bucks. you can still get in if you don't have a 3D printer. You, for 149 bucks. it doesn't include a Raspberry Pi, but for 35 bucks, So for under 200 bucks. You can have yourself a 3D laser scanner, and he's planning on delivering this uh, within like a couple months. So, um, yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, and, there, and there shouldn't be any reason for it. I mean, this particular printer, I've seen something similar before. A lot of this is already out there as open source, so I'm not surprised. The funny thing is, a company called Rubicon, which I interviewed last year, uh, was supposed to do the same thing. In fact, actually, they released it in 2013, and they've only shipped a few of them so far. So they not had even fulfilled their Kickstarter or their Indiegogo. And the big reason is he started out with something like this, and a lot of people bought into it at 200, and then he switched in 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 mid gears uh, into a, a you know it looks like it's a better product, but he had all kinds of engineering issues, and it just took you know a long time. And I still think he hasn't fulfilled a lot of people's. Um, 
Kickstarters yet, and then he's taken pre-orders. So I think he's gotten himself a little over the, his head in this. So if this guy sticks with this simple, easy-to-use product, um, then everybody will be satisfied. Because, you know, when you look at it, you said, yeah, I want one of these. That's what you should give them. You know, you shouldn't use the money and say, well, I'm going to come out with version 2. I don't think that's fair to your backers. You know, this is what they're buying. Um, right. So hopefully he moves forward with that. Uh, and I will put my dollar in uh, when I get done with this program as well. Eight All hours right, to go, gonna... so yeah, so not a lot of time for, for anybody out there, but it will be open source, so uh, after the Kickstarter ends and uh, uh, the, the files will be published eventually, um, but um, we can follow, if you, if you pledge a dollar, you know, what's a dollar, you know, right? Yep. Well, remind me, I'll make sure I do it. Okay, so on to my next item. Um, you know, I like to cover all the 3D artists out there that I can find or are using their, their artistic capability to create 3D objects. And then I, I caught this on 3dears.org, um, again, another good article by Alec, um, who talks about this fabulous thing. And the important thing is, you know, last year, yesterday we had Jasper from the Netherlands, um, who is, I would say, the motion capture master. Uh, he has his own products out at Breckel. But the important thing is he's in, from the Netherlands as well as Ultimaker from the Netherlands. And then this guy, which I think follows us in our own program here, because I, I remember the name or seeing it somewhere, uh, is also from the Netherlands. So what, do they have something in the water there? I mean, they, they, they seem to have the 3D guru expertise. But uh, if you look at this character, I mean, look at the detail. And I'll get down to it if you read the article yourself. So yeah, I'm familiar with this name, and I don't know why. Uh, but I've seen him before. But look at the the detail. And the reason I, I'm really uh, amplifying this is that he has uh, uh, superb detail in the painting. Why? Because he painted it himself. And he goes through and talks about his painting process, and there he is. And he looks familiar. So I want to say that for some reason, um, either I've asked him to be on or I've been following his work. I don't know. Um, but I will try to get them on and we can talk about it. But look at the detail. You know, obviously these are 3D renders, but look at the detail. Here's the actual unfinished model. Wow. And then here are the parts. He made a comment that because of its size, you had to break the parts apart. And here is an actual 3D printed model of it. Unbelievable. And here are the parts. And then here's the fully finished painted. And he said when he painted this, he said it took him like hours. Um, he had to do all of it in daylight. And the reason is to say if you do it in like, you know, incandescent or um, artificial lighting, you don't really get a full idea of the, the color range that you need, and you had to do it in daylight. He said you'll be in tears if you try to do it in artificial light and then come back to daylight. So I thought <laughs> that was funny. Um, so, you know, the question was asked, well, are you planning to sell these? He said, no, they're not really profitable. This was just kind of a a work of passion, but man, is it a, a work of passion. Look at the detail. So I'm going to email this guy and get him on. I want to I want to find out, come on, you got to sell these. Even for like $200, I think people would buy something like this. But you Oh, know, in Japan, got, you go to the character the character uh, exchanges they have in Japan and they sell they sell characters for thousands of dollars that are like yeah, this. Yeah, and he made a comment about that. He felt that the market was already saturated, but um, well, regardless, it is an amazing model, you know, and we've had um, Aaron as well, I can't think of the other guy from Germany, um, who are using their 3D printers to create articulated, really interesting objects, and again, uh, the Ultimaker has been the one to, to back some of these great 3D artists, hint, hint, to Lozbot, and, um, <laughs> and uses them to, to, to promote their product and show off their stuff, so um, excellent. Hats off to them, and hopefully we can get them on later. And um, let's see, you got one more item, or are you done with yours? I'm done with my item. I think we're ready to bring in uh, Mr. Harris here. Okay, let's uh, do but so. I have, but he's muted for some reason. Yep. Oh, uh, there we are. Hey. How hey, are you doing? Being kind to us. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, you're good to go. We are good to go. So we awesome. have heard, uh, we have uh, covered, but Lulzbot actually has a new 3D printer that just came out on the market that we've been hearing. I haven't heard anything but really rave reviews about it. You guys must be really fired up about it. 
Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for having me. We're really excited. So the new machine we launched at CES and, and now it's shipping here uh, to our customers around the world is the Volspot Pin. And so, yeah, you've got the product page. I've also got it over my shoulder here. It is the, uh, the smaller machine behind me. And, you know, basically, long story short, this printer is so easy to use. We did experience testing. Our youngest was 12. Our oldest tester was 65. Uh, and then everywhere in between, and everybody had prints up and running, and usually under half an hour. Uh, it's everyone really, really excited about it. We, it's, we just think we've tackled a ton of problems, and it's still super versatile, open source hardware, free software. Uh, so we're really excited about it. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah, and it's uh, and I and I really I I personally I just got a TAS four a few months ago, and I print on it every single day, and um, you know in my business. And one of the one of the great uh, thing that I've learned is is uh, kind of using it in conjunction with matter control which is uh, the the 3d print engine that I use and I really really love how compatible it is and I just got, actually got a matter control touch which is like a new little Android device and it just came on Monday so I've been playing with that um, because it's uh, basically a standalone for 250 bucks you have this little touch screen and you can essentially drive uh, most any 3D printer, but uh, they actually demo the Matter Control Touch with the Wolzbot Mini in their new video, and i um, happy to see Matter Control or the Matter Hackers crew is selling these direct too, so you can buy them uh, either from you guys at lulzbot.com or you can buy them uh, from Matter Hackers. Yeah, so sh yeah, definitely shout out to the Matter Control and the whole Matter Hackers team. They're, they resell our machines, and, uh, and Matter Control for desktop is free software, and you know, it's it's great. They do a really good job, and we really uh, definitely like working with them for sure. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, we had uh, we had John on from uh, Fargo's Printing, and he did an, an open box. He's got a YouTube video that seems to be doing doing really well. He did a good job of uh, uh, recording it. But we had him on last week and kind of uh, talked about it. And he's got great things to say about it as well. So, you know, it looks like you got a a winner there. Uh, I've got some questions on your design, though. Uh, I noticed in the background there that you, I'm assuming that's the power supply off to the side there uh, attached to it. Is that correct? Uh, no, it's not. So that's actually a power supply for the TAS 3 behind me. So the mini oh, has okay. an enclosed power supply. If you want, I can just get up and bring it over if that would be easy. Yeah, please. A cool, uh, it's a cool little printer. It actually has some unique features on it. Um, you can watch at SparkFun is selling them as, as well. Um, so if you go over to sparkfun.com, they have a little demo. Um, if you guys are, if anybody's in Mountain Time, they're kind of a great. I, I order a lot of parts from SparkFun, or I, I put a lot of support behind them. They're they're just a great company. But they've they've got a great launch video for the. They were the first place I think I even heard about the the Taz Four was uh, through SparkFun or the, yeah. the the original Taz or whatever it was. Um, the because they're right in Colorado, uh, not too far away from you guys. Yeah, yeah, SmartFun's awesome, and just that power supply, so it's enclosed here, you can't really see it, maybe through the vents, but basically, yeah. it's a Delta no, auto, well, auto switching power I was, supply. Yeah, you know, the point I was making, though, is that it is attached off to the left-hand side, correct? Uh, yes, it is in this enclosure here on the left-hand side, yeah, but it's not, uh, so, it's not separate. No, and... and and I was actually going to commend you for that. Uh, many people just provide a brick that you, you have to throw off to the side. So I'm assuming all you have to plug in is a standard computer type AC cord in the back of it. Now, does that also contain uh, the electronics as well, or is that just the power supply? It does, yeah. So everything, this is basically everything you need. You just plug it in uh, to the wall on your laptop. And it has a mini Rambo, which is made by Ultimachine. Uh, so it's oh, open source okay. hardware. And, and we partnered with them and did a lot of you know, sort of collaborative development on the board. So is it, great is it the board. newer Ram? Is it the newer Rambo board with the faster uh, microcontroller? Um, some of the problems with the earlier Rambo is that their UART um, was somewhat limited as far as how far you could, or fast you could transfer files to it. Um, is this the faster UART? Do you know? Uh, I don't know about the UART specifically, if I'm hearing you right, but I can tell you that it's basically their newest board they put out. So it okay. just just came out, uh, and it's a mini, it's a smaller version uh, than the full full Rambo. But uh, oh. yeah, does it have all the same ports? It has a fewer ports, so it has yeah, it's it's just kind of pared down a little smaller. If I had a hex wrench, I would take it apart and show you, but I don't have yeah. one. No, so it's, it's probably <laughs> only it's got probably only four stepper controllers on it. Uh, uh, one for the excluder, one for the three axes, and then 
probably only one heater element. And does that have a heated bed as well? Harry? It does. Yeah, it goes up to 120. Yeah. So then it has those two um, controllers as well. So yeah, I'll yeah. have to look into it. But and one of the nice things. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, the, the important thing, and the reason I keep bringing this up is, you know, if you've got this tied to a computer, because I does this does this have an SD card slot? Uh, so this is. Uh, Tethered for now, you got to plug in the laptop okay. for now. But yeah, this is matter, matter control touch and some other uh, wireless options. Yeah, so if you're using tethered either with a laptop or if you go with the Astro Print or one of the print controllers we talked about earlier, having a fast UART built into these uh, micro boards like the Rambo is important because that's what uh, kind of regulates how fast you can move data into the, the, the stepper system and store it on its internal memory. Um, so, and I've noticed that some of the earlier ones, it's only like 115 baud or something like that, and the newer ones can actually go up to 512 um, or faster, and you know, faster speeds are important. Some of the newer boards that are being used by some of the other people can actually go up to one megabit or something, or two, I can't remember exactly right now, but they're fairly quick. Um, so if you don't have an SD card, uh, the umbilical cord needs to run fairly quick. So that was the reason I was asking those questions. Yeah, and and I will mention one of the things I really love, and the reason I really back Lulzbot, and I'm I, I I'm going to add more uh, of these TAS printers probably here pretty pretty soon, is the fact that it's open hardware, and you guys are so good at keeping a directory of files that are freely open for everybody to go and download. So like. Even it, so if something goes wrong or you want to modify it or something gets upgraded in the future, the machine is totally upgradable. Not only that, but like you can go and you can download the file you need to make it better all the time. So I have a perfect example. Like right now, I, you know, I guess we'll move right into our projects of the of the week. Is I'm I'm doing a V2 upgrade from my Rostock Max, right? So. Uh, Rostock Max is a real great, uh, is a is a really awesome Delta printer. I've had I had it around, um, I've had it around for a couple years now, and it's it's been a really, uh, it, it's just a really um, solid Delta printer. But one of the things that I I don't really care for is I never really liked their Easy Struder. I I just I had a lot of jamming issues and um, it just it just didn't. It, it never really uh, extruded like some of the other extruders that I've had experience with. One, the, the best extruder I've seen is the Wade's Reloaded that the, that the Taz uses, which is, I, I think, one of the reasons that it does it performs so well. And so what I wanted to do is I'm upgrading my, my, my V1 Rostock to a V2. And um, so yesterday I, I actually disassembled uh, the Taz 4. I have a dually extruder. I disassembled it. And reassembled it as a um, you know as a Wade's Reloaded, and then and making my own part to mount it to the Rostock V2 because you guys put your files freely online, which is so great. And uh, so that's kind of where I'm at with it. And um, I just that's one of the things I really I really love. So it's really easy to like take it apart, and you don't have to be afraid because there's documentation there too. You guys have this whole OHI section on your uh, on your on your site. If you just go under support. And uh, click under. Uh, you can go to these Ohi. Uh, these uh, where, where, where's uh, the Ohi guides? If you click on guides, you guys have these this amazing sec section of guides. Um, I'm trying to find uh, where we're going here. Lose that little spot. It's I think under download. I see. He wrote in Ohi kit is pictorial assembly instructions. Yeah, but then there's other Ohi kits, correct? There's like some other uh, there's some other ones. Yeah, I'll mute. Um, Harris, the reason I muted you is you had a lot of background noise. So. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, sorry. I mean, yeah. uh, I don't know, obviously we don't. I don't have a special uh, <laughs> media room, so if I'm if my noise is bad, just mute me. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, that's what I did. So I <laughs> noticed that you typed there. So I apologize for you not having sound. Oh, that's okay. Um, yeah. So we have. I mean, we're really proud of the documentation. So we uh, we don't have like two sets of folders, you know, where it's like, oh, when something's done, we throw the code over the wall and let everybody else see it. Instead, our R and D team works on devel d e b e l dot lulzbot dot com, and, and that's basically all of our R and D files. Uh, that, and they're probably available. They refresh every 15 minutes. So thanks for your business, and glad to take advantage of that. And we actually have a new hot end for the task coming out, uh, just right around the corner here. That's uh, the same as ships on the mini. So it'll be all metal. Goes at the 300C. 
and uh, it's going to be it's going to be awesome. It's doing really really well so far. I think you're going to like it. Big upgrade from the Buddhist nozzle for sure. Oh wow, awesome, good to know. I'll have to uh, have to get one on order. Yeah, because my and that's the other. So that's the other uh, project I've been working on is um, I. I really love the bootish nozzle. It's been a really great head for me, and I have had no problems with mine at all. I print high-end ABS out of out of my printer, and I haven't had one jam at all. It just awesome. prints all, it just prints all day. And uh, but one of the ones for my row stock that I just upgraded to via MatterHackers.com is uh, the E3D All Metal V6 hot end, um, and they include all the parts. And one of the things I really appreciated um, was they. They, they throw in all of the parts you need, not just some of the parts you need. Um, you know, like a lot of these hot end kits you get, they come with okay parts, but not great parts. And um, yeah, this has just been a, this is just a great hot end. Uh, one, of the, one of the better ones on the market. So for 90 bucks, you can get an all metal hot end. It's super serviceable. You can swap the tip super easy. It's very modular. So you buy it once, and if anything jams on it or you're having any problems, you can just buy the part you need. You don't have to buy an all. You don't have to buy the whole unit like with the J head. So uh, I, I'm really excited to see how it prints, and I'll I'll have an update for you, or I'll have an update for our listeners next week on it. Hopefully, when I have my Rostock V2 up and going. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, that's a very nice look. I think I said it the last time. It's sexy looking. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just in time for Valentine. On that note, <laughs> I'm going to segue into my uh, section. If you see behind me here, let's see. Yeah, there we go. Uh, that's my wife, Siobhan. Uh, I did a scan. Oh, stop it. <laughs> um, um, yeah, her face has been plastered all over the web. Um, I'm the guy that saved her life. The man who saved her life is going to save her eyes. A knight in shining armor. Yeah, I guess. Boy, she brazzes me about that. No, actually, she played a huge part in uh, her own research for removing of her brain tumor. So if you read the story, it just came out in our local paper as well. So I guess we're finally getting tired of it. But I thought I would do, I'll bring this up right now before I get into my story. So I thought I'd do my my own little impression. I sent off a version of this to CDC, but you know when you stay up as late as I do, you sometimes go wonky. Um, so this is uh, <laughs> our, our latest little image. Oh. That's, <laughs> that's what I'm starting to see in my dreams. Okay, but uh, all right, back to my image. So like I said, I I use the the structure sensor, and I'm going to show off a new oh. version. Um, First of all, Connect 1.8 is out. So if you're a structure sensor or a Connect or an ASUS Action or the PrimeSense sensor, um, this new version is out. If you are a um, structure sensor user, they're now supporting a new version of HD Color. And what that means is they've got some new proprietary techniques in order to um, overlay um, HD Color on Vertex. And the results are stunning. Um, geez, uh, maybe a little bit later when you, you talk about your promise, for, I'll show it at the end. Uh, I'll have to find the image, but I did one while we were doing some alpha and development testing for it um, with my four eyes, and it looks as good as an ITSY's image. So you no longer need ITSY's 3D. Um, you can use high HD vertex coloring and with um, four eyes. Uh, or without it, uh, the results are good. However, this particular one behind me was done using the structure sensor in ITSY's 3D, and uh, I had to do some tweaking, and I was going to go through that process real quick here, so let me jump to uh, my background screen. Uh, I used a product called 3D Coat, and I'll bring in a, another model of her, not this particular one. Uh, but what the important thing is, uh, actually, I'll just go to, I've already done some steps already. So the important thing is, uh, if you're using ITSY's 3D, it only limit or it limits you to about 50,000 polygons. Well, that kind of creates a rough surface. So one of the things I do immediately, and I, I'll bring this one in, is I do uh, something called uh, subdivision or a subdividing, which gives me more polygons to work with. And one of the things that happens, if you notice the hair on this particular model here, uh, again, courtesy of my wife, Siobhan, uh, you see some rippling here. Well, one of the cool things about 3D Coat, and you can do this in Mesh Mixer, is that I can go into uh, the tweaking features, and I can go to Smooth, 
and I can actually, just like painting, go to my model as soon as I can zoom in on it, expand my brush, um, modify the brush head, and notice how I'm smoothing the object now. Now, notice I'm creating some issues in the UV mapping here. There we go. Um, but notice how things are being smoothed now. And again, you can regulate how smooth yeah. by either using your right mouse button or using the uh, the radials up here. Uh, let's see what I would want to do. And notice that I'm all my smoothing here. I can drop this down to a really low amount. Now I don't know if I've actually subdivided this model. I didn't find the original in my quick study. I don't think so. So again, what you want to do is subdivide it because the more polygons or faces that you're working with or vertices, uh, the smoother the smoothing function will work. Um, so 100,000 works good. If you can bump it up to 200,000, that works well. And a side benefit of that is when you actually look at these models in NetFab or on your, your slicer, uh, it will be a smoother curve. Uh, the problem with this over using visual uh, renderers is that visual renderers have a smoothing function built into them. So that's why things might look smooth on your computer, but as soon as you bring them in your slicer, they look chunky or they look um, um, blocky. So again, subdivide your model. Uh, 200,000 still provides really good performance. Uh, some of the models that I'm um, scanning are like 2.5 million vertices, um, so they're a little bit uh, harder on your machine. So if you're going to be doing this uh, professionally or as an avid amateur, get yourself a beefy machine. They're not that expensive. So again, I'm using 3D Coat. Uh, one of the strengths of 3D Coat is it literally is like a Photoshop for three worlds. So I can go in here and uh, Let's see if there's something. I think I've cleaned this one up. But let's say I had a patch. And one of the problems, yeah, up on, whoops, I didn't want to do that. Luckily, we have a lot of undo functionality. Um, you can go in up here and notice how there's some patches. And the problem with any scanner application, especially if the person is standing, is how do you ensure that you get a good scan on top? And more importantly, does the UV uh, mapping work properly? Well, in this case, it didn't do so well. So luckily, there is a tool, just like in Photoshop, that allows you, let me adjust the brush. Uh, to take so a sample and, and kind of translate it somewhere. And I'm going to do that right now. Yeah, there we go. Ah. And then move it. So there we go. So you could take like some off her forehead, take a sample off her forehead, and give her a bald spot. Uh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, I Make her a that. monk. <laughs> yeah. But notice that. Uh, whoops. Make sure. Okay. Oops. Make sure you pick an area that matches. So if you have any Photoshop experience, it works very similar to it. I cannot believe the detail of uh, on the on the dress or the blouse part uh, portion, yeah. well, even in the hair and everything. What was the and, and you took the scan using a structure. Yeah, you, you use the structure sensor and a program called ITSYS 3D. So if you've got an iOS device, the ITSYS 3D program is free, um, but you have to buy the structure sensor, which is, I think, $375. Um, I am making cases, as you know, over the year. It's um, called the Neody mount. Um, let's see. I'll jump back to my picture. Uh, this is an example of it. And... Uh, the Yodi mount uses a magnetic mount system so you can quickly attach and detach. This has the RGB lens on it. I'm using, in this case, an a iPod 5G. And I'm trying to convince them that with Connect, you don't need anything more than this. However, if you want to do everything self-contained, you'll need something like the iPhone 6 or, or the iPad Air or the iPad Mini uh, Retina. And I guess they're going to be coming out with their version 4 in March or April of the Retina, which has all the power of the Air 2. Um, but, yeah, it slaps on like this. Um, if you have an iPad or an iPhone, uh, the, the app is free. The reason why you have this quality, and let me jump back to this, um, is they use what they call... Um, UV texturing where you overlay imaging so they not only take the mesh but they also do the processing to lay the images and they now are using the full resolution of the camera this wasn't done with that it's only like three megapixels but they're now using the full resolution of the camera which is eight megapixels with the Air 2 or the iPhone 6 or 6 plus 
One caveat, I mentioned the iPhone 6 or 6 Plus. They do not support the iPhones yet. I've encouraged them strongly to do so. They just don't feel that there's an audience for it. So if you, the listeners, feel that it's important, um, let them know that. You know, let's start a campaign. They should put this product out. You know, what's all of us, in fact, I can bring mine up here. This is an iPad mini, so it's not even an Air. And again, it's got my Neodi mount system on it, so I can literally go from one iPad to an iPhone with the structure sensor in a matter of seconds. But, uh, you know, you have to pretty much use two hands. Mine here, and I sell this case, has a tripod support, so you can put a handle on it for one-handed operation. But m iPads are a little unwieldy. Don't you think it's just easier to be able to have a one-handed operation. You know, you can go underneath the person. If you look at one of my videos, you'll see the strength of using a portable device like this, an iPhone. So I encourage you to do a campaign. Get it seized to make it for the iPhone. You know, I'm a developer. I've already turned uh, the occipital ad, um, ad into an iPhone app. I can't show it yet because I'm under NDA, but uh, I know it's not that difficult, so please, Itsy, if you're listening, make the changes. You've got a cool app. Don't limit it just to the iPad. So back to this. As mentioned, it's free. I don't know why it's free. Uh, I would think that they would charge it. The important thing to remember is you are sending your information to their cloud, so who knows? Maybe they're collecting information and they're going to make clones of everybody. I don't know. I can be a conspiracy <laughs> theorist myself. You know, the guy is from Russia. Uh, I know, just kidding. He's a great guy. We've had him on an interview before. We but, have uh, beautiful Russian bride for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't get it. Yeah, Come uh, meet. Come meet. Bring thousands. All right, so once you're done with this, then um, nice thing about 3D Code, it supports many types of export. And as long as your model is watertight, and there are some functions in there to do that, but I prefer using NetFab, I can export my model now. Uh, in multiple formats. The thing to keep in mind if you're going to create, and uh, I'll go back to it, uh, my other screen, if you're here to convert shape weight type characters, and here's what I call the Verizon girl. I went into the Verizon store to test out my iPhone 6 Plus. I case. need a new serv I need new service all of a sudden. Okay, well, she's in Los Osos, <laughs> but... Uh, I so knew it was going to be in Los Osos, and, uh, you know... Okay. All right, so... <laughs> Essentially, if you want to create something like that from this, um, like I said, subdivide your model, uh, use the tools in 3D Coat to modify the texture, and then export it as a WRL or a VMRL, VMRL file. The reason for that is that that's the only thing that Shapeway supports. If you do an OBJ, you can import to Shapeway, and I'm actually going to do this now. Um, let's see what we want to do. Let's just go into the root of this. And then it will tell you, well, what do you want to bring in? I don't want to use Targa. I want to use PNGs. Um, PNGs are larger, but they're lossless, so you don't have any compression of JPEGs. So I would suggest it, plus it is an open source file format, not like JPEG. Um, then only export the uh, the color you don't need to export the specularity it doesn't support it and then uh, leave the rest there and then export and if you have the options here of doing a low poly mesh or a mid poly I'd keep with the mid poly because again you want a smoother uh, 3D printable object so it should be going out there right now in fact it may be done so I will close the application and then go back to uh, we don't want to save your screen's not up, you know. Oh, thank you for reminding me. Of that. Now I'm back up. All right, so I didn't show you that, but I did save it uh, as described. Now I'm going to go out to my Shapeway. And uh, Chris, you um, remember I ordered you yours because yeah. you know you are my Valentine's this year, so I did send one, ordered Thanks, one for Mike. you. And then I also made your model. The cool thing about Shapeway is that you can do this for other people <laughs> and then share the file privately so they can order it themselves. <laughs> Don't be grumpy. We have a yeah. yeah, Shapeways. Right, so let me sign in. And these are uh, SLS powder-based prints. Shapeways does a pretty decent job. 
And the coal color is the um, yeah. It's actually, they call it sandstone. It's a gypsum base. They use a color impregnated glue uh, in order to bind the gypsum together. Uh, but I have some tricks that uh, I'm going to show in just a moment. So give me a moment to, to go to models, and this will give you an idea of the models I have up already. Oh, come on. It's not you know. the fastest site. Uh, here we go. And let's see, I want to upload. Where is the upload tool? Yeah. So there you are, Chris. So if anybody wants to order a Chris, it's available. No, I didn't I'm make them sale. public. Um, <laughs> but I will make it. And, you, and uh, yeah, they've got some cool tools in order to do that. Um, where is my upload feature? Um, mm hmm. Upload is up to the left, top left. There it is. Gee, you know, the, the big button that says upload on it. Yeah. Okay. So then you select your file. Um, leave it at millimeters because normally that's you work with. I'll go directly to this drive. Yeah, that is an important point is, you know, that I, that I obviously have plenty of experience with is whatever program you're working in, um, you know, STL is, a, is a, essentially a, um, it's a unitless file. So one is one, but it doesn't know which, which kind of one it is. So if it's one millimeter or one inch. So when you, some, some programs like slicers and things, they'll import the STL and you need to make sure that your import matches your export from whatever application you're working in. So um, that's kind of an easy thing to do when you first configure it rather than having to scale your STLs and you're always wondering, oh, why, why is my thing coming in all small? Or, oh, my God, it's way bigger than I thought it was. And usually it has to do with um, either your export, whatever application you're working in is exporting as millimeter, centimeter, or inch and whatever you're importing into might be uh, different. So like for me, it's a, it's a SolidWorks preference or a mesh mixer preference, and then you need to make sure in matter control or uh, whatever slicing software um, you're using that import or even shapeways that that matches what you're exporting because otherwise it's not, it's not going to be the right size. Uh, that you are totally correct, Chris. And another thing to keep in mind, too, if you're going to have to expand the size of it, this isn't like a vector drawing. You are still only limited to a certain number of vertices. So if you start expanding the space within the vertices, the, the model starts getting chunkier. Uh, and I've noticed I've had some issues with that. So try and stick within the limits. Um, there are programs out there, as I mentioned, do subdividing. Uh, this is just like in Photoshop. You know, you can't add something that wasn't there to begin with. So make sure that you're running with an original model at the proper uh, uh, scale and uh, measurement system. Sorry. Right, so back to my screen. Uh, one of the things that I forgot to do, and I did it while he was talking, is you have to zip a color model um, because a color model includes both a the mesh file, but also the texture file. So what I did while he was talking, and hopefully it went into the same there, is uh, I created something called archive zip. You want to rename it because they do use that name to identify the file, and then you upload it. Um, so this may take a little bit of time. Uh, but depending on how fast your connection is, um, this is, I think, what it would say, a 3 meg file, so it shouldn't take too long. So once this thing is uploaded, there we go, it will then open it and convert it. And again, like I said, make sure you export it as a VRML or WRL file, and then that way it will recognize that it will have color. Well, unless you're like me and you needed to do more. So yeah, it says it needed some repairs. Perhaps it's too small. Um, so make sure that your one your model is watertight. That's why I use a product called NetFab to verify that, um, or use Mesh Mixer. But make sure it's watertight. This model may not be. Um, so obviously it failed here. Make sure your scale is correct. And I don't want to take any more time. Up. It does work. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to put Mr. Uh, Copac up here, um, or my wife and others. So uh, let's get back to my screen. So once you get your model back, and I had some other images, um, as Chris said, it's kind of a matte sandstone type finish. Well, you're probably wondering, well, how did I get you know 
that what there we go wrong hand there go. that behind me the kind of a glossy porcelain experience well there is a product and we've talked about it before called XT3D or actually XTC3D and this product is kind of like a uh, epoxy varnish and you mix it just like an epoxy but it has a different viscosity so you can paint with it and so what you literally can do with FDM prints and uh, Harris um, I recommend anybody getting it who's doing FDM because it fills in the ridging and then you can paint it and it's as smooth as as an SLA print it's excellent stuff it's reasonably priced as I mentioned before the uh, shipping is a little high uh, but uh, the pricing of the actual amount, and I've been using it for several weeks now and haven't run out of it, so it's really affordable. It's like $20 for, I don't know, a, a quarter of a gallon or something. I can't remember the actual volume. But uh, in this case, it now allows you to give it a more vibrant. Notice how the color stands out in it, and uh, I'll actually show uh, my Verizon girl here. Uh, one of the things that I found out and notice that I've kind of deteriorated the color on this. I thought, well, I'll put it on there and it creates the glossy experience you see behind you, but what if you don't want a porcelain? Maybe if you want more of a plastic or subdued look. So I thought, okay, well, I'll just, you know, what, what's the term, burnish it or um, with my little Dremel tool. Well, I found out the heat seems to deteriorate and cause dark spots. So I started losing detail in my models. So I probably don't recommend doing it that way or doing it by hand. Uh, not using a Dremel tool for it, so I had to order another one of my little mini wife here um, because I kind of ruined this one. Sorry, honey. Um, but uh, I didn't do that to the Verizon girl, and all I did is I then put another uh, layer or a spray of a matte finish uh, spray coat on it. So just a clear matte finish, and it gives it more of a plastic finish. And, and again, the colors are vibrant. Yeah, which is something people have uh, been disappointed with uh, with this type of color. But as you can see here, it's pretty vibrant. Wouldn't you agree, Chris? I mean, I didn't pump these up or anything. Uh, in the case of my wife, what was kind of funny is that her hair color kind of turned out green. She's um, more of a light redhead, but I preferred her as a darker redhead, so I... I painted her hair a different color. So <laughs> the, the power of... Uh, tools I guess so that's kind of my quick tip um, you know obviously 3d coat uh, is not free but it's you know less than a hundred dollars uh, they were running a special of 79 during the Christmas holiday but I think it's back up to a hundred you can buy it on steam or you can buy it on their website um, it's based on the educational or the uh, the entrepreneur or the hobbyist price they do have a more expensive version that takes in uh, higher textures you can only go 2000 by 2048 or 2048 by 2048 uh, which is more than adequate for doing the shapeway thing but if you want to work with higher resolution textures you'll have to bump it up and I think that price is 380 uh, don't quote me on that but go out to 3d coat to find out more about it and uh, yeah I, it's a cool tool and I plan to do that over the before the Valentine's uh, scan some people so that they can create little versions of themselves you know once you have it in 3d form you can add a little hoop to it or to make it into a little locket or something you know so they can wear you around their neck I don't know I'm being stupid now but uh, who knows? <laughs> but uh, yeah I do have this on my monitor above my desk now so it's kinda neat um, she's awesome. always near my heart so that's my my item so why don't you go into your print whisper item, and then I'll get back to um, talking about some of the sure. new products that are out there, and then uh, some updates from the past, and then we can end this show. Sure. So, so my running a little long. My print my print whisper tip is pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory too. Is use what works. Um, I've done a, quite a bit of explore, exploration, um, different, and, and we kind of went into it with my row stock upgrade. Is I was having problems with my extruder. Uh, there, the Wade's extruder is a geared extruder, and it um, basically converts, uh, you know, your standard NEMA 17 or any whatever stepper motor. Um, instead of being directly, your hob bolt being fit, fed directly off of uh, the axle of the stepper motor, it actually goes through a gear mechanism, and that's what makes it have a higher torque. 
uh, coefficient, so it can actually um, apply more force to uh, the filament compared to a direct extruder. So the geared extruder gives you a little bit more torque. Uh, I shouldn't say a little bit. I think it's like four times more or something. Um, and so I've found uh, that I have a lot less jamming issues and it, it can actually squeeze filament and, and it doesn't strip the filament um, as much as uh, some of the other extruders I've worked with. So that's why I think Lulzbot uh, uh, maybe cho chose it as their extruder. They use a specific one they call the Wade's Reloaded Extruder, I think is right. Can we unmute? Can you show us, Chris? Yeah, can we unmute Harris? Har Harris and, sure. uh, yeah. and uh, so 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 am I am I am I explaining this correctly? You are, you are. Wade's, yeah, Wade's Reloaded. Uh, I think Greg Wade. I forget the. Uh, We've got all the, the attribution on our development site, but yeah, weights reloaded, direct drive extruder. Yeah, and and uh, so I've had really a lot of good luck with it. And so if you have a printer that works, um, what I would do is I would just print print one of these out, and here it is. And you're going to need a few a few parts. You can make them on your own, um, which there's some instructions on how to do it. Um, you need there's there's like just some uh, parts like a bolt that has a you know obviously a, a hobbed bolt. There's a special um, they call it a stopple. What is it? Stopple 15. It's a no. That's a hot end mount. But there's a uh, um, if you go to repwrapfab.org, they have some different explanations of it, I guess. Um, but right under Thingiverse, there's all kinds of makes of the Wade's Reloaded, and it's a tremendous extruder. I have no issues with it. Um, I haven't had any any issues with it as far as an extruder. Um, and so what I would recommend is if you're having extruder issues, go out and make yourself one of these. And what so what because because really what it what it is is it, it give it it eliminates your extruder as being the variable that's causing print failures. And um, but what what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to also flash your firmware so and and go through the guide, um, go through a guide to um, come up with a uh, um, you know a a plan to to implement the Wade's extruder on your specific printer. So you're going to have to calibrate it, probably flash your firmware, which uh, right on Lulzbot site they have a nice little uh, they have an they have a uh, let's check it out under their. Uh, guide section, I believe it is. Um, if you click on your their guide yeah. section, while he's looking for that, Harris, um, I've got a Maker Gear MT, and I think they use the same or similar type extruder. And I found a group in um, Israel that makes a fully machined aluminum version of this, and it is super. Um, maybe I can get you in touch with them. It's a little more pricier, but I have found that plastic uh, parts sometimes. I don't know. They they eventually lose some of their their rigidity or something. But uh, I found that this has really helped me improve my uh, my extrusion, uh, and I'm pretty sure it's very similar to this uh, as far as being direct driven. And the parts look very similar to it. So maybe I can put you in kind. They're called Micron. Um, um, it, it'll add a little bit to the cost, but uh, it's really a nice machine. To, uh, Experience. Yeah, and and so so one of the one of the great parts about it is um, you can go on where one of the one of the tips that I'll give you and I'll leave you with is you're going to need to get your e e steps right specifically for you know the Wade's Reloaded. There's a great guide over on Ohi Kits um, from Moolsbot. If you go to their guide section, you could probably just Google the term single extruder calibration workflow. Uh, Lul's bot, and it'll probably bring you right to this uh, to this wonderful guide they have on getting your e steps calibrated. And uh, yeah, so I'm working through this right now. I'm upgrading my row stock, like I said, to uh, to incorporate a Wade's Reloaded. Um, so can't wait to see it running. Very very cool. Yeah, the, you know, and we're both agreements on this, Chris. Direct drive is pretty much the way to go if you you want to work with different materials. Um, it just, in my opinion, is more control. So if you, you were talking about your stepper motor being geared, is that built into the actual stepper motor? I've noticed some of the earlier rep wraps, they created a gear outside of it to provide the reduction. Uh, is yours internal? 
Well, so the Wade's Reloaded, the way that it works is it has a smaller gear on the actual axle of the stepper motor. Okay. Um, and then it, and then there's a larger gear that actually dr is attached to the bearing that drives the filament or the hobbed bolt that drives the filament. And so what that's doing is converting the torque. You know, you have a small, you basically have more steps on the filament side and fewer steps on the gear side, and that is converting torque so that you have, you know, essentially more torque on the filament. Yeah, the other way that I've seen that done is that they build it into the front of the stepper motor, so all the gear reduction is done internally in the stepper motor and provides that four to one reduction as well and keeps it within the stepper. Adds a little more cost to the stepper motor, but uh, it's self-contained, which is also on the my M2. So yeah, uh, and I think I for for the reason why that the Wades and probably Lulzbot went this went this route rather than having a specialty motor. Is because this is very serviceable, and you can you can use any off the shelf, uh, essentially any off the shelf uh, stepper motor. Seventeen. With the weights. Yeah. yeah. So, which is really common. So, for you know under fifteen bucks, you can you can buy a motor, and then you can print these parts out for a couple bucks, and have a nice, uh, you know, extruder. Yeah, that the gear reduction does add a little bit to the cost. Okay, well, let me get on to some of the, the products of the week. One that I thought was kind of neat, uh, and I'll play it behind me, is this new product called Monolith. Uh, it is a another voxel um, editor, uh, but it has some interesting tools that it... Uh, well, you can see what it's doing here. So the interface looks pretty nice. You can download it for free right now. Um, and then start playing with it. I haven't had much time to do it, so I'm just running the video here. Um, but it, it's another tool. Interesting, notice they use the rabbit. That seems to be something that all of them like to use. Um, Euphormia, which you talked about last week, coming out with a beta version. Uh, the mesh mixer has the same model. I don't know, it must be that common generic rabbit model. Um, but notice it also has a slicer built into it. Um, and then uh, I've noticed it can use um, 2D Im imaging to create uh, 3D models from, uh, which is the technique you use for creating topos. There's a technique for it, I can't remember the name now, but you use grayscales in order to create height information. Wow, very cool. Yeah. And is this, uh, it is Monolith available to the public as a product yet? Um, yeah, you can go and download it. Yeah, I think it's still beta, but uh, you can go download it for free right now. Huh. To go check it out. Yep, looks pretty neat. Um, so, and I like its clean interface. It's got a more modern look to it. Hmm. And notice it says voxel-based modeling engine for multi-material 3D printing. Um, so it immediately will provide you a, a multi-material uh, uh, file, which is what we talked about earlier um, with some, one another company supporting. So, um, yeah, so check it out. It looks like it, it, it's well polished already. I don't know. I haven't actually used it yet. Downloaded it just the other day, uh, so I don't know how crash-proof it is. But uh, so far, it looks neat. You know, that's kind of neat uh, that it can actually bring in DICOM images. Um, so I'm going to be playing with that, obviously, since I have a little experience with that. Um, clean interface. Uh, looking forward to working with it over the weekend. All right, so on to another <coughs> voxel type. Actually, they're the king of uh, organic, and that's ZBrush. ZBrush also came out with a new upgrade. If you want the Cadillac of organic modeling, uh, this is the product to get it. So if you are a professional or looking to be a professional, this is part of your tool set. You know, there's no hits or buts. One of the nice things, at least when I bought it, is that it has infinite upgrades. So you know, since I've had it for some time, I keep getting it and no extra cost to me. So that's a cool thing with them. Uh, what do they offer in this? Uh, Array Mesh, Nano Mesh, and Z Modeler with Q Mesh. These are some new features, and it goes through to the Z model that's built into it, allows it to do more architectural or what they call hard surface modeling now uh, instead of the standard organic. So you can create models like you see here. Uh, and then they give some examples. 
Uh, another important thing, especially when you're working with high detailed uh, meshes, is the ability to create instances and which allows you to create multiple high resolution objects without taking up more memory, which keeps the machine running fast and not using your memory. Uh, it also has this interesting feature that I want to play with, and that's called creating surface noise. So that way you can build directly in the model um, surface distortion, as they show here, a, a wall. Um, that's kind of a neat. Uh, then it also incorporates Keyshot. I think you've talked about Keyshot before. It is a high performance uh, renderer, or what do they call it, uh, image renderer. No, I don't have the right term for it. You can look it up. Um, if you're a ZBrush user already, they have a special pricing that you can get uh, this version of Keyshot for altogether for like $300, which is way lower than what you normally can pay for. Very cool, creates hyper realistic type um, rendering if you're into that. Yeah, it now finally supports 64. Um, it is, I think, still in uh, a preview edition, uh, which allows you to use a lot of more memory, which has been somewhat of a bottleneck in the past. Uh, has a new VBX import exporter. Has a has a a new R mesh, which is really important, and is when you will need to re let's see retopalize your your objects. Um, you need to have the ability to do that uh, with some customization, otherwise uh, your models can look kind of funky. Uh, supposedly that's new in it. Um, there was another feature, uh, dynamic subdivisions, so that you don't subdivide every part of your model at the same rate, uh, only in the areas that may need it. So like if you had a critical high detail area, so that will also help support the number of vertices in your model. So it's a very cool product. I've used it in the past. I should get back to it now that I've got all these features. Um, if you're in organic modeling and now with hard surfacing, you can use it for standard architectural or man-made objects as well. Um, neat product. It, you know, it's a little, I can't say, it, relatively speaking, as far as 3D modeling programs, it's, I think, 800. I can't remember the exact price. So I, I think it's still under 1,000. So it's still, a, actually, let's, how about we just click on this, buy, see if it comes up with a price. I guess it won't until I actually go into it. Okay, well, I'm, let's see if I can quickly do that, and then I will run on to one other item, and then we'll be done. Uh, with that, and then we'll look at upcoming events. So let's see, yeah, $795, so it's still under $800. So for a 3D modeling program, it is still fairly reasonably priced. You know, it's still, you know, if you're into this or just getting into this, it might seem a little pricey, but if you're wanting to do this for a living, I do also believe that they have an educational product as well. Okay, well, that's Pixelogic. Final item. Um, if you remember, we talked about Einscan S in the past. Um, this was a product by a company called Shining 3D, I think out of China. And they have a new tabletop scanner that's unique. It doesn't use a laser per se. It uses a projected um, uh, a scanning process. That's what the S stands for. Uh, no, what does the S stand for? Uh, I can't remember now. Damn it. Memory is failing me. But essentially, it's kind of taking like the structure sensor or any type of projected image scanning system and converting it into a tabletop. Uh, what's cool about this product, one, they're on Kickstarter, and it looks like you can still get in at the $799, uh, but also, as I mentioned, if you get in at any of the lower pricing, or maybe they've taken it away, um, in the past, or in the, when they sent it to me, they were going to offer like a $100 price that would be good for like $200 or $300 off the unit when you want to buy it. Um, it appears that they took that away. So if you want one of these, you can still get in at $7.99. And uh, what it will allow you to do is scan using a different technique. Down here they show some actual um, quality from it. So you can go out through their website. Um, it's faster, higher accuracy uh, than laser scanners. Um, I did see it at CES. It does seem to be work like it says it does. Uh, if I had some money, I'd get another one. But sadly, I've got enough scanners coming out of my ears. But I want one of these. Uh, the other cool factor that they don't show here is not only is it a tabletop, you can remove the actual scanner itself and use it um, as a stationary on a tripod so you can do larger objects as well. Very cool product. Um, so if you need one, you might want to look into it uh, if you've got $800 to spend. All right, so I think that's all of the updates from the past. I think that's all of the products. So 
we are at the last item, which is events, and sadly, I didn't put that up. Uh, can you click on that link for me and see what's coming up in the uh, the new news? It's upcoming events. It's down there on the bottom. Again, thanks to 3D Printing for Beginners uh, for showing the fair events. Uh, yeah, so it looks like uh, we have, um, let's see here, Cam 3D. A lot of it is happening overseas. We've got the 3D printing show, Next Revolution in Multi-Material Fabricated Parts. That's happening in Las Vegas come February 17th. Um, okay. We've got uh, well, keep lots in mind, of we happening have overseas. Internet. We have an international audience, so overseas to us doesn't mean you know our guests from Netherlands. They might be right in their neck of the woods. So let's That's not true. ignore the fact that. Uh, yes. Yeah, so in Germany, we've got an inside 3D printing conference and expo in Berlin, um, happening March 3rd and 4th. Um, in the Netherlands, we've got Rapid Pro 2015 happening, um, and then we have uh, actually in the U.S. Um, we had uh, John Ollie telling us about. Um, the Midwest Midwest Rep Rap Fest, which I would love to try to attend that this year, and that's happening March 24th and 25th. Um, so that's going to be a really cool show uh, with the Rep Rappers. Um, I don't know if Harris is planning on going to that. Um, here, let's say. Uh, yeah, so I'm not going to be going personally, but uh, LF Objects, we will have a little spot booth there. It's an awesome show. Very strongly recommend checking it out for whoever can. RepRap community is still thriving and really actually doing quite a bit. It's very exciting to see uh, as the industry matures. There's still a lot of rep rappers in IRC and on Reddit and elsewhere. Um, and that event is just a great place where a lot of developers and hardcore users and companies come together. It's a really, really good event. Awesome. Well, uh, I think that pretty much wraps up our, uh, our Friday edition uh, podcast. I just really want to thank you, Harris, for... Uh, uh, coming on the program and and uh, you know joining us today and kind of telling us about the the Lulzbot Mini that uh, I can't wait to get my hands on one and and try a, to demo uh, some parts on it. Um, it's got some really unique features like an auto bed leveling uh, feature and a tip wiping feature and uh, it's it just looks like a really bulletproof little machine for you know not that much money so. Yeah, Harris, if you've got a demo model and you want an honest, critical review of it, send it our way. <laughs> All right, perfect. Good to know. And thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me on. It's great chatting with you. Thanks for letting me uh, you know, crash the show. and uh, Really appreciate it. Awesome. And thanks to our listeners, and we will see you next week on All Things 3D. Bye. <laughs>